Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Training Tidbits podcast show. I'm your host, Ryan Cartledge from Animal Training Academy, and I'm extremely excited about having you here with us today and being back in your eardrums to talk all about best practice behavior management for what is set to be another amazing episode. I can't wait to dive in and learn all about today's guest and their learning odyssey. If you haven't checked the past episodes out yet, then make sure to head on over to www.animaltraining.com trainingacademy.com and you can listen to them all there or you can also find them on itunes and slash or on stitcher there is definitely something there for absolutely everyone as well as some sensational up-and-coming episodes planned over the next wee while just before we do get started though i want to say a massive thank you to everyone that listens to this podcast on a regular basis or Maybe you're joining us for the first time ever. The show is so much fun to make and I get inspired thinking about all the people that have benefited from all the wisdom our podcast guests have shared. Today's episode is, of course, going to be no exception to this. And if you do like the episode today, then please share it as far and as wide as you possibly can. I appreciate a lot of you listening to it from the podcast app on your mobile devices and smartphones. So one thing you can do that would be really appreciated is navigate to the title of the podcast around there somewhere you should find three little dots if you tap on this it opens up a menu and in that menu there's an option to share so you can easily share it on facebook twitter linkedin instagram snapchat whatever social media network you might be using and i would be extremely grateful if you could take a couple of seconds just to do that but we will get started on today's episode where I'm going to be talking to Dr. Jennifer Zaligs. At the forefront of the animal training industry, Jennifer Zaligs, PhD, stands as a world-renowned animal behaviorist with over 30 years of experience, award-winning presentations on animal behavior modification, and numerous publications to her credit. She recently published Animal Training 101, the complete and practical guide to the art and science of behavior modification. Dr. Zaligs is the owner of Animal Training and Research International, which oversees a small teaching aquarium affiliated with the Californian State University System. Of all her pursuits, Jennifer is most proud of her students and finds the greatest joy in teaching and working with those passionate about their interests in conservation, animal care, and training. The center of her work is to foster a nuance and advanced understanding of behavior modification through a transformational learning theory pros slash cons model. This model provides a thorough foundation of the science of behavior through behaviorist, cognitive and ethological psychologies balanced with a practical understanding of the art of training. Dr. Zalegs hopes to engage students to further inquire and develop the art and science of behavior. Her students now work with and manage a wide range of animal programs throughout the world. Dr. Zalix currently teaches at California State University, Monterey Bay, and she regularly teaches in partnership with several other colleges of behavior modification worldwide, mentoring students in cutting edge animal behavior and husbandry. So without further ado, it's my very great pleasure to welcome one Dr. Zalix to the show today. Jennifer, how are you? I'm going good. How's it going there? Uh, It's going well and very excited about getting this opportunity to talk to you today. So thank you very much for making time. It's my pleasure. Absolutely. Fantastic. And we're going to dive straight in to the first question today, Jennifer. Could you please take us back to where you first learned about positive reinforcement animal training and some of the first animals you ever trained using it? Yeah, so I got started at the National Zoo in Washington, D.C., and that was almost 40 years ago. I was, you know, my story was strange. Like many people that are interested in animals, I thought horse training was going to be my thing. I wanted to ride horses. So I took some horseback riding training classes or whatever. And this would have been when I was like seven or eight years old. And it turned out that I had a minor allergic reaction to horses. But I had the unfortunate situation where my mother was an immunologist. All my family are scientists. My mother was an immunologist and she was worried about the critical development period of a child's immunal response. And so she forbid me from um, training horses. And this caused a huge fight between her and I. And so she actually found a animal training course that was designed for like high school and college students that was being offered through the Friends of the National Zoo that we were a member of. And she convinced the lady teaching the course, whose name is Casey Cover, 
she convinced that lady that I should be able to take the course. And I took the course and it was all about positive reinforcement, bridge and target training. And she was really at the forefront of training from her experiences as well. And she was bringing training to the wide zoo environment 40 years ago when most of the people were keepers, you know, sort of the tradition used to be there was a difference between trainers and keepers. And that was a commonly marked point. Certain animals in a lot of zoos were trained like elephants. Typically, if you had marine animals, marine mammals, they might have been trained, but most of the other animals weren't receiving training. And Casey had brought that into this zoo from the aquarium experience that she had. So I guess my answer is I've never known anything else. (laughs) I was fed it as a child. And what I ended up doing after the class was I was really engaged with the bridge and target work. And, you know, I don't know if you've taught any kids how to train animals, but they actually learn, in my experience, quite faster than adults in many ways. And so I likened myself to be this great prodigy. Of course, that's probably total rubbish, but I didn't want to stop. And after the course was over, and so she wanting to encourage me as positive people do, she said, sure, you can volunteer, although technically you're too young. So she put me sitting in front of groups of animals and watching their behavior and taking notes ostensibly to like scientifically research, you know, gain information about their behavior sort of ethologically. Later, I read those notes like 10 years later, and they were just complete, you know, what can a seven year old say? And I could barely write probably very well at that point. But what it did was I sat in front of collections of animals for more than a year, writing about what I saw them doing with one another at the zoo. And it gave me a really good talent for reading behavior, which is one of those areas of behavior modification that is actually quite difficult to teach other people to have, is being sensitive to the intercommunication that's going on or what being open and listening to what the animal is looking at, thinking about, you know, referencing and that kind of stuff. So that was my first experience with training was in a class and then just basically kind of gearing in and and absorbing something of an ethological viewpoint from watching just collections of lots of different exotic animals. My first fun training memory was working with sloth bears who, if you haven't worked with a sloth bear, they are insect eaters, they're insectivores, and they have these really ridiculously long claws and mouths that have incredibly good suction in order to suck the insects out of the wood that they bore into. And we discovered that this was a terrific mechanism for floating grapes through the air. So I would hold up a grape, which is something we were using as a reinforcer. We were training them to give paw presents and PC exams. And then we started holding the grapes further and further out. And it turns out it was like they could pull a grape from your hand. My memory was about a foot away. (laughs) So you could watch this grape like suck through the air to to this perfect little O of this bear's mouth. So that's one of my like outstanding early memories. Of course, as a child, I'm thinking of it as a foot and I haven't gone back and tested that idea as an adult. So we'll have to see if that's still true or a big fish story. I don't know. (laughs) So Jennifer, you grew up in a family of scientists. Your mum was an immunologist, you said. And how lucky of you to have her support and to find a way to get you into this field. We got the opportunity to observe animals and you've kind of indicated how important that is, how important of a skill that is to develop. Can you just build upon that for everyone listening? And how that, that pathway, if you like, into what you then did afterwards, how important that was developing those skills early on and your observation skills. How important are these observation skills? You know, I've had this conversation with a lot of other trainers who are responsible for teaching other people to train animals. And I think this is one of the things that makes somebody highly successful and extremely adept, their finesse capabilities. And I do find you can put someone in a situation to try to learn this, 
but some people maybe learned in their early life a social awareness or some other kind of disposition that is a little bit extroverted. Scientifically, we would call this theory of mind, which is the idea that what's going on in my mind is not the same as what's going on in your mind. And as I'm interacting with you, I am present and aware of that concept at all times. I think that that actually is an extraordinarily important aspect of animal training. Maybe it's even the most important part. There's a lot of incredibly good animal trainers who know almost nothing about the science or the terminology. You know, I guess that's changing as time goes by, but it's fairly typical historically for even brilliant trainers to essentially not have a formal education in the subject. So why are they so good? A lot of that has to be a certain kind of social awareness and a understanding. And what it feels to me like is that your brain is sort of always got multiple channels going where one channel is receiving constantly the feedback and information of the animal's body language, orientation, general behavior patterns. And you have a, what it feels like for me is like a percentage interpretation. You want to not tell yourself that you know how they feel or what they're thinking, but you'll have some kind of what it feels like is a probability analysis based on all of these behavioral attributes and what I understand about the species in general, the environment, and probably my own biases. And an awareness of that and that interacting with what you're doing with the animal, in addition to all the sort of basic science things like antecedent behavior consequence and all the things we have to understand, really gaining an insight into the animal's both understanding and motivation, and that's coming off of them, is what's very critical to your success. I mean, how big of a jump you can take, how big of an approximation has to do with your estimation of their confidence, their fluency. You can just play it really conservative and scientific, and you can just break it down into tiny, tiny steps, no matter how confident they are, and that'll take longer. Or if you feel that you know where they're at with it, because they cognitively are following you, then you can take bigger jumps. And motivationally, this reading animal behavior is also critical. You know, do they want what you have to offer? Are they worried about something? That kind of stuff. It is It's a subject that I find super, super interesting. And I've only scratch the surface of how to really teach it to someone else. Like I understand what was done for me because basically I learned it during a critical language integration window. You know, there are critical development periods where your brain is kind of set up for certain kinds of information to come in more easily and human beings have language learning windows. And that's why it's easier to learn language when you're younger as we all know. And I think that that was a side effect benefit that I got out of the situation. So one of the lessons might be start learning training as early as possible. Teach your kids, you know, I don't know. So I like this idea of probability analysis. And I always resonated with this idea of wearing a a pair of behavior glasses. And I kind of have this picture in my mind of us being like a Terminator. (laughs) and We've got little pieces of data coming up from our right hand side of our vision, giving you the probability analysis. And you said that it's challenging to develop techniques to teach this to others. How's that going? And is this a factor of being something you can teach or does it come down to time and experience, do you think? (laughs) Well, you know, you'll find a lot of my answers are very gray. That is to say yes and no on almost everything. I don't like absolutes because scientists in general don't commit to absolutes. And I think that's a sign of a critical thinker, by the way. One of my favorite phrases is, the wise never presume to be right about anything. That doesn't mean they're not right. It means they're keenly aware of the limitations of their knowledge. And that's why it's a probability analysis, right? But also to the point, can it be taught? I think most behavior is learned by far, being a behaviorist sort of maybe more fundamentally than any of the other psychological disciplines, although I am multidisciplinary. I think certainly that learning will continue to improve your ability to have these glasses on. And I love your analogy. I think that's really apt. For me, it actually is visual, I should say. This is going to make me sound like a crazy person, but I have little windows almost in my consciousness that are 
subvisual but actively visual in my cognitive processor that give me almost text messages over people and animals heads as I'm interacting with them. (laughs) It's what it feels like. I do think you can start to dial someone in. I suspect everyone's got a different operating system they're working with and way that they would process this information. And some people may be more similar than others. The first thing I do teaching people is to focus on the science and the very clean, clear, objective stuff. And reading behavior is in that weird, fuzzy gray area that lingers over into anthropomorphism and slides into that quite easily, maybe disastrously easily in many cases. And so it's not best perhaps to focus at that level to begin with, because actually most people will have so much anthropomorphic intervention in their viewpoint of behavior that it will really muddy their behavioral analysis. So it's almost better to kind of pull them back to the pure science first. But then the truth is, is you can see the people that have a natural affinity for these things that comes out even at an early age, level of training. And I feel like I can teach or I can help open the pathway to someone who has what I would describe as a really high aptitude or a really low aptitude in this direction. And they can both progress to points that are very advanced. But the person who has what I would describe as kind of a natural reading talent, given the same unit of practice time, so looking at it as a scientist would, I feel that that talent will still lead them higher than I can naturally teach somebody even through exposure. So it's still a puzzle that I'm trying to develop and I don't have a magic wand. I do think that the best thing is this science-based, you know, kind of critical objective approach. I've sort of expanded that beyond the typical science and I've tried to quantify the art form as well so that I'm in some sense giving people some of these spidey senses a little bit more nuanced. That's really what people talk about. I spend a lot of time talking about pros and cons. This is me trying to give them the instincts that I have in this direction. And I do think that's effective. And then what everyone says, there's only one way to learn how to do this, and that's to do it. (laughs) So time and experience makes a big difference. But it also does really help if people point you in the right direction. So we do a huge amount of mentoring where the students will be training an animal and I will point out in real time for them, do you see the angle of the animal's body? They're looking at this. They're distracted by that. They missed the cue to help dial them in. We also do human on human exercises a lot. That sounds horrible, but that is a real common way we do things. Any technique or any procedure we're going to put an animal through or any environment that we're going to get into, or as the trainer is starting to learn any new cue or anything like that, we practice first outside of the training session. And then the person with the sort of physical body memory, the skills when the animal isn't right there on board, then they go inside and practice not for the very first time with a live animal. I guess that's debatable. But first of all, I own all my animals and they're very long lived typically. And so I don't want them to have to suffer any fools. (laughs) So I, I try to not put as much pressure on the animals as I do preparing the trainers in advance. But also I think that it helps the trainers to separate. I mean, it's really an approximation for the trainers to separate their physical skills and understanding of that and then put the whole other brain in there that adds a layer of nuance that's exponential as a second approximation essentially so wonderful and i loved hearing about uh, all your insights there and and also your behavior odyssey hey thank you very much for sharing that jennifer oh yeah that's what i'm here for thanks for asking (laughs) (laughs) extremely welcome for the next question can you now tell us a little bit please about your book animal training 101 that we mentioned in the biography what inspired it and what have you learned from the experience of releasing it well my journey has been mostly one of i i sometimes say that i'm kind of a grand unification theorist for behavior you know there tends to be camps of behavior that might be either scientifically based so in that sense 
sense, you would say ethology, behaviorism, cognition, and neuroscience. And I got my degree in a interdisciplinary psychobiology environment. So I was already crossing the sciences. Whereas I think most people do this, they kind of embrace it from a behaviorism standpoint, or what used to be called behaviorism is now called behavior analysis. And the alternative path that people are often experiencing is kind of the art form or the school of real life, however you would describe that, the experiential way or inside somebody's training system, like the clicker system or the teach T-touch system, where someone who's got a lot of experience, like Karen Fryer or Linda Tellington Jones or one of those kinds of people, they put together a, a high probability system of preferred strategies and kind of a step by step or something like that. And I find all that viewpoint very interesting. They often don't cross over, like the people who have systems often are not paying attention to the science, or they are, but they're only paying attention to a portion of the science. And I'm really kind of interested in the things that unite all these different groups, behavioral groups, and being able to create the most user-friendly, organized way of thinking about the training techniques and what people are really doing in practice, married with the view of how the science discusses those things. And sometimes science is way on top of it and knows a lot about it. And sometimes science knows shit all about what people are doing because people may be very well ahead. Psychology is not just a hard science, it is the hardest science there is because it is the confluence of the most complicated system in the world, which is your brain. You are, congratulations, by the way, all you listeners, you are the most complicated thing we know of, not the universe. Scientifically speaking, your brain is as complicated as it gets. And that level of complexity, which is hugely individual specific, just at a genetic level, that's the nature point. It is also hugely individual specific at the more important point, which is the nurture point, the, the experiential point. Every experience you have is creating new neural network connections in your brain. So you're completely unique. And each individual, therefore, is this incredibly elaborate system that is interacting with the chaotic, elaborate environment, right? Because the environment itself is, you know, typically not a little science experiment. It has got many moving parts and pieces and all that kind of stuff. So you've got these two really rich features that ultimately conspire together to create behavior. So that makes this whole discipline very, very complicated. And anyone who tells you differently is, I think, exaggerating, <laughs> let's say. So the way we've solved this problem, I guess, is by breaking it into small bits and all these different camps and lots of different realms. And what I've been interested in, because I've been running a behavior modification school at the university. I've been working at university most of my career after I left the Smithsonian, which also had a research element to it. I have been at either UC or Cal State or, you know, associated with a number of universities. And so I've been teaching courses on animal training. I've been trying to come up with the sort of like a confluence of the science and the art. And that material, I'm getting to your question. I know this is like the world's longest winded answer, but that material that I I've processed down from this very rich, complicated set of inputs has been going on for me with my classes where I was giving out sort of manuals and things like that. And every year I would advance it. People have been talking to me for years, like, why aren't you making that available for people to buy? And the reason that I hadn't made it available was that I change it all the time because I'm learning, you know, I'm, I'm going to have learned something in this conversation. Just your mention of the eyeglasses and your view on the reading of behavior has already given me a new tool in my way of talking or explaining. So it didn't seem like it was ever going to be possible that I could be satisfied. But finally, I just said, geez, what if you die, Jennifer? You know, that's not very good. So let's, I mean, dying, that's not good either. But what I mean is you've got to get something out there first, and then you can edit it and you can let the community edit it. And that way, at least you've contributed in some way. And so essentially, I've been synthesizing this which started with the six basic operant techniques. Somewhere along the line, about 20 years ago, I realized one of the things is that there is fundamentally kind of only six central unified techniques that people are using. And then what they do is they kind of modify them and combine them. So that's 
pre-shaping or scan and capture, baiting and luring, mimicry, imitation, observational learning type stuff, targeting, manipulation, molding. Sorry, some of these are terms that are the same. Manipulation and molding are the same terms. Native reinforcement. So those sort of six techniques, I've not seen anyone train an animal without one of those six techniques engaged. So I started to kind of quantify that and put the art into the science. And then I put it all down on paper and I published it a couple of years ago. And immediately, of course, the first thing I felt was, oh, I've got this new term for something else I had been using a previous term for, and I wish I had put that in. And so it goes. Second edition is already hot on the books, but at least the initial birthing is over. (laughs) If people have feedback about the book, I consider it kind of a living, breathing document. In other words, it's not fixed. And I would like to solicit information from other people who are using it as a reference where they feel things should be changed or added or whatever. And I want to speak that I am interested and open to that to the extent that anyone is wants to contribute. And I like your idea of letting the community edit it. And you said the second edition is just about to be given birth to. Additionally, you've given birth to (laughs) an online course, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah. I should stipulate I'm not about to give birth to the second edition. (laughs) I have started taking notes. uh, Well, I have been taking notes. I'm perpetually taking notes for the second edition. And I've got quite a volume of accumulated edits such that I would like to begin work on the second edition, but I'm rather slow and you might notice quite long winded. So it takes a while to edit me down to a proper amount that anyone would tolerate or want to hear. I anticipate the second edition will still be years away. And in the meanwhile, I decided to start offering some more live experiences. People have always been able to come to my facility and do internships, actually working and training the animals that we have. So unlike a lot of facilities, you can actually come and train our animals on site with us and kind of fit into the job training program and the career development program that my proper students are doing in various ways. But obviously, that's quite expensive because somebody has to come to California. So it was actually suggested to me by a veterinarian, Dr. Susan Brown, who is a very well-educated animal trainer in her own right and has her own facility. She and I connected through a conference or something or through the book, maybe, And she came to the facility here to do one of those professional internships and suggested, why don't you do an online course? (laughs) So that was how we got started with that. And it's been really great because now people from all over the world can sort of affordably have the crazy Jennifer Zalig experience for themselves, you know, and hopefully that offers more options for learning, just like you're doing here with this podcast. You know, I guess the technology as it's evolving is giving us new tools for instruction, which I'm trying to learn how to do and make available. Cool. Thanks for that, Jennifer. And for those listening, can you just potentially build upon that just a little bit and add some information about when the next available openings are for your course and how someone can find out more information about that? Yeah. And thanks for the plug, by the way. That's very kind of you. I am teaching the course this year in three parts long, but I've combined two parts together. Part one is focused on the techniques associated with conditioning behavior primarily. And so it's very associative learning and operant learning with the six basic operants focused. And that course I actually taught earlier in the year, but it's available on demand. So the first part of the class will start on September 20th, and it will be available for three months on demand. You can take it at any time you want. That's part one communication. And then the second two parts to complete the course are motivation and practical training, putting it all together. And that actually is going to be offered live as well as on demand. If you want to sign in and interact in a virtual lecture platform, you can ask questions and that kind of stuff. And that class will start on October 18th and run till the first week of December. And you'll have the ability to take the on-demand all the way through the end of the year. So you, you get sort of three months access to the course, depending on what part you're taking. And you can find out information about all the individual lectures. The 
in total, the full class is 15 lectures long. And it won't surprise you listening to this, that they're pretty lengthy. They're like two hours a piece. I'm trying to make them shorter. So for the next class, maybe I'll <laughs> manage that. I have so much to say that I'm quite excited about the subject of animal training. So I can jabber on and on, but 15 lectures. So it's probably 30 hours of content. There is some discounts available. Although I think the air point of this podcast is going to exclude some of those discounts. But what I was thinking of doing is just for your listeners, if they hear it on your podcast, they can email us and we will give them the what we're calling a study buddy sale. There's a study buddy sale, which is if you enroll any student with a new student or any two new students, you get quite a lot of discount. It's $100 per student off the full course. So that would be $200 discount. If you sign up together, that is only only available for a week right now. But if you find out about this and you want to do it, you say that you got it through the Animal Training Academy, we will honor that discount for you. That's your personal scoop, Ryan. So you go to our website at www.animaltraining.us and you can find information about all of our courses and wanted to do a internship Or you can also come and take live courses here that we offer for university credit. They're offered every year in the summer. And there's a couple of different courses, one of which is animal training, but another one is marine mammals because we have marine animals here primarily. And so people who are interested in developing a career in marine mammalogy often come from all over the world to work with the animals here and do the coursework at the same time in the summer. Cool. We'll link to all of this stuff in the write-up for the podcast as well. And if you want to get that special discount that Jennifer's kindly offering, then email her and mention the podcast. And let's throw in a keyword for fun, eh? How about you email Jennifer and, and say the keyword sloth bear? <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Fantastic. Hey, thank thank you so much for sharing all that. That was a lot of fun to learn about, Jennifer. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, it's a lot of fun to chat. And anytime you want to do repeat, you can fire me up on any other subject you like. Fantastic. Hey, can we move on now to talk about something you mentioned a couple of times, uh, and that is Animal Training and Research International. And you're going to have to correct me if I get this wrong. The pronunciation is sleuths. Ah, yes. Uh Uh-huh. No, you have it. Yep. And can you tell us about some of the research you guys have been involved in and how training fits into this research? Yeah. So the project at the university level, which is the affiliation with the university, is called SLUS, and that stands for Science Learning and Exploration with the Help of Sea Lions. We've had various marine animals involved through the course of the years, but it's been mostly a sea lion thing. And it originally came off of some particular research I was doing. I actually have built a couple of marine mammal facilities. And the one that I'm currently at, or in, I guess, is the marine research station at Moss Landing Marine Laboratories, marine mammal facility, which we put in to house our animals that are working in a huge wide range of research projects. Myself, I have a private independent business called Animal Training and Research International. And these two things are kind of in partnership with one another. The truth is, is that ATR is there so that it can support the not-for-profit work of SLUS. It's hard to make a living in science. I mean, the university pays me to teach, but they don't pay for the animals upkeep and marine mammal facilities are extremely expensive to run because of the constant need for salt water and the improvements and the enlargements and shake gloss and all of the maintenance kinds of stuff. And since we're not a normal public facility where people would pay to come in, although the public comes in in various programs, we needed some way to generate income beyond the slings and arrows of soft money, which is typical for research environment. So that's what ATR does. And I teach courses and all that kind of stuff. And the book revenue all goes in that direction. The research projects to get to that part of the answer, I'm really a partner with a lot of other scientists working. Of course, I've done my own science as well, but um, I tend to be approached by scientists who are interested in asking questions using the training that we have. One of the hallmark elements of our program is that we do research with animals. We don't do research on animals. 
It's a distinction that I make, obviously, as I am primarily interested in behavior, behavior modification. I'm an animal trainer, and I want to engage the animals in all the activities that are associated with their lives, their basic care, but certainly anything I would like to have them do, meaning I would not do research that it was involuntary. So that creates the limitation, but it also gives open the window of you know extraordinary options. And in the early part of my career, that was a fairly limited number of people that did it that way, like in the 80s. <laughs> and so we could answer questions about cognition or physiology that were quite different, that were not filled with stress artifacts. Because if you're forcing an animal to do something, that will obviously naturally color the data. And this was a very famous thing with diving physiology, for example. If you hold an animal underwater, you force them to stay underwater, their physiological response is quite different than if you ask them to stay underwater. So that became one of the specialties that I had. And that's a big part of my academic career was involved in asking questions a lot about physiology, growth, development, veterinary sciences, and cognition. And then what happened was we had animals that were trained in order to answer some of these questions. We were taking the animals into the open ocean to use the depths of the ocean and the real swimming conditions to kind of add in the study, a more wild type environment. And then I was approached by a scientist who wanted to partner with sea lions or marine animals in order to engage them as a study platform for the wild environment, in particular to study the behavior of whales. So this was like in the 90s, mid 90s or something like that. And before digital cameras or right at the point where digital cameras started, but they were still large and extremely expensive. We're not talking GoPro. You know, now if, if my career started now, I just can't even imagine how different it would be. But he was sort of at the forefront of what's today called Critter Cam. We did a, a lot with National Geographic back in that time. Unfortunately, the camera technology was not moving fast enough back then so that animals were wearing these huge video cameras, which created a lot of drag. So even though we did get some data off of it, it was sort of prohibitive. And it was very expensive being in the development phase of a new underwater camera technology <laughs> and stuff like that. And I don't know if you've been told, but you don't get into science for making money. Well, I guess some disciplines do, but not my type of science. So that was a challenge. But for several years, we were working with animals, free release, wearing video cameras, filming mostly whales, but dolphins and some other aspects of the marine environment before the funding was just untenably difficult. And we had to kind of close that program down. You also need quite a lot of special permitting and sort of emergency management stuff from the federal government standpoint in our in our country to release the animals into the wild and have them come back. And I think I'm the, still the only person other than the United States Navy who doesn't have to apply for permits to do this in the United States to work in free release with marine mammals. So that obviously opened a lot of doors and it was a very interesting training challenge. You know, if you just think about the objective of, okay, you're going to try to explain to a sea lion to go follow a whale, how would you break that down? If you, you know, whales, we don't have them in managed care. That thought process, and I hope that's stimulating some of you and you're thinking along the same lines as me, or maybe even better ways. You know, I used other animals as surrogates. First, I used humans, and then I used dolphins and some other animals we had as surrogates. Go follow the dolphin. <laughs> Imagine how much fun the dolphins thought that was. They did not find that fun. And then we created replica whales. Then we hoped to encounter wild ones and send them after them. So that was probably the most famous thing that we've done in addition to the other research. And uh, as a result, I ended up kind of with an ambassadorial role from the United States. We did the World's Fair in Portugal in 1998. Some of my animals were chosen as mascots and representatives of marine science for the United States, which was an amazing honor and a tremendously cool, fun thing to get a chance to do. I still can't believe it happened. That kind of set the launch point of my later years professional career, I suppose. It opened a lot of windows for me.
amazing experience and for people that are listening and we you've mentioned this a couple of times throughout the episode already but can you just build upon just in case you have some potential future volunteers or interns out there in the animal training academy podcast audience can you just build upon some of the opportunities that you offer volunteers and interns yeah definitely so if someone is volunteering they're often at a university level or a postgraduate level and they will often stay here well the minimum is they're working at the lab for a year. And we offer, I think it's five layers of certification for people getting that kind of professional career advancement and job training. And they often do it in concert with university degrees, but the certifications are animal care, assistant trainer, trainer, and senior trainer levels. In addition, if that's too much time and you don't want to come and live in California, you can come and do several levels of internship, which is shorter. And you have to pay to do this, I should say. So it is also volunteer, but you're also paying for the experience. So it's more of an advanced credentialing trainer for a day concept. Typically, those are done in five day, so for one week period. And you can do a general level of internship or professional, or we even do a junior internship where young aspiring trainers from like age eight or nine to age 16 or something can come to this facility for uh, periods of days. And the system works where the student starts at a husbandry level, like most internships do, but immediately we begin to develop their, I guess this gets back to the thing we were talking about earlier, their reading skills. We give them a start to their relationship with the animals through the process of pre-feeding, which, you know, in a science word might be non-contingent reinforcement, although there is a little bit of contingency to it. It, it involves looking for the animal's calm and controlled attention, which is a great start point to any behavior for any species, to tell you the truth. Like it is the, that is the go-to start. Are we together? Are we good? One of our sayings is make a connection before you give direction. So we start with that. And then the students will be working in protected contact and start some litany of maybe five or 10 behaviors that they learn how to give cues for. And then they work into free contact with the animals and actually increase their training, their behavior number over the course of however many days they work with us. We only do a couple of interns at a time because you're getting pretty much full-time attention from the staff. And so even without an intern here, we would have probably five people on staff at any given time taking care of the animals and doing the various programs. And you fit basically into the staff and you learn one-on-one with wonderful, wonderful. I have the greatest blessing in the world, the most awesome staff ever. I mean, I know everyone thinks that this is like thinking that about your children, but it's really true. Like all of our exit polls, these people are just, they're rock stars. And I think it's because what we try to focus on is using the same behavioral principles with our staff as we do with our animals. That is to say, we're focused on their well-being, we're thinking about their needs, we communicate and we motivate them. There are incentives, there is praise, there is lots of feedback. And so it's a very hands-on learning environment. In fact, that's such a case that I originally found it off-putting to think about online training because I didn't want to fail to be there to support and mentor the students. And that's my new thing. I'm learning to let go. (laughs) That's the internships. And they're very, very affordable too. I think some famous parks will charge you a hundred or two hundred dollars for an hour to swim with an animal and we would charge you that for working with them all day and with a much richer more educational experience we're a university so we focus at education and the well-being of the animal is the first priority but the students well-being is extremely central to our model as well so it's a great opportunity if you're going to come to California you should check it out because people always just rave about the opportunity. And that information is all available on the website? Yeah. So on our website, right from the top bar, there's either classes and workshops, which give you the information about the online or the in-house classes and workshops, which may be in your area. As well, at the top, there is a volunteer and internship button. And I think there's also a button that says certifications. 
So if you're interested in understanding about the certifications, we're now offering certifications with the online class as well, so that if you complete the full online class, you can get a general behavior modification certification if you take a test and pay an extra fee. And if you want a more advanced certification, you can do so by sending us videos that qualify demonstrating the use of a bridge stimulus, a target caging behavior, that kind of stuff, depending on the species you're working with. We have a program for that now in place. So that's kind of an exciting new ATR certification that you can get. Awesome. And you heard it here straight from the doctor's mouth. (laughs) Make connection before you give direction. That will be the name of the podcast. Great information. <laughs> That's nice. I've been trying to come up with memes I lately. Know. My my primary one that really famous for is Come Bearing Gifts, which you've done very well by offering these podcasts because fundamentally what you do is give first and then you hope it comes back. And that is what I think is the central training principle. You, in fact, if you're interested in that principle, there is a button on my website that's called training resources, and you can download image slides associated with some of these memes. We're adding new memes all the time, and they're free. You can have them. That's what got me thinking about it was come bearing gifts. I wanted to give people as much as possible. In fact, it's been very difficult for me in my career to even think about charging people for stuff because I'd rather just expand and allow. My motivation is hugely about the well-being of animals and I would just give it away for free. I mean, that's how academics are anyways, but it turns out that the sea lions want to eat every day. So there's got to be some financial generation, but you have nailed the come bearing gifts meme, my friend, which doesn't surprise me. And it probably is a demonstration of being an excellent trainer. It's a first indicator. Well, thank you. And thank you to everyone who accepts this gift of this podcast uh, and accepts it regularly. We really appreciate you as well. So I know that with regard to the information you just gave, there's going to be loads of people who listen to the show that's going to be highly beneficial. So once again, thank you very much for sharing all of that, Jennifer. Oh, you bet. You bet. Well, this next question, this is something I get asked a lot. And so I was really happy when you brought it up as well. But this question surrounds what should we be training? Can you talk to this? How should we prioritize our training goals when thinking long-term about the behaviors we want to train? Ooh, I love this question. What a sexy question. Thank you so much. This is my favorite subject, actually, in a way, because, well, I don't know. Is, Is there such a thing? No. But I really think this is the center of where we need to be, the new evolution. And also on that meme slide area that I was just referring to, you'll see something that we have put out which is a start point of this, and it's called ATR Behavior Decisions Hierarchy. It's basically a tree. It's intended to represent not an absolute linear progression, but a general guideline towards where your heart and your emphasis should be as an institution or an individual in terms of the most positive life that you want to create for your animal. And to me, the tricky bit is getting institutions to do this. The beginning of it needs to be that you're training first for the care and the well-being of the animal and second for your personal objective. And I know that's often a difficult way of thinking about things. Well, the whole point, you know, for a lot of people of training animals is, well, I want to ride my horse or I have to give shows. I work in a public display facility and I'm mindful about those realities, but I really feel like from an industry standpoint and also from what's close to my heart and what I think, you know, unites the positive community, but maybe unites all of us is that the well-being of the animal has to be the start point. And that means that you are training behaviors and modules that will most directly impact the medical, mental, and physical well-being of the animals before you're training for, or at least in parallel to training for your human-based objectives which can be very difficult for people who are in a situation where there's a lot of pressure to produce behavior for public interactions or for public shows. And I think that's actually one of the things that's giving the industry a poor name and is poor for the trainers and the animals, the sort of overwork or the misplaced focus. I guess it's not for me necessarily to decide, and I do think ethics are personal, but I know that from interacting with trainers, the reason somebody gets into this is not about making money (laughs) 
police, I, I hope. If that is you and you figured that out, please private message me, but also do something else, you know, software design or I don't know, because that's not what this is about. It's a labor of love career. And I think we, we kind of know that. And if you don't know it, you'll know it fast as soon as you start doing this. There is no hours to this job, right? The animal is, is there and it's alive. This isn't a motorcycle. So that is, I think, what's in the heart of people who are choosing to interact with animals professionally, for the most part. I'm not going to say there aren't exceptions to that. And I know that that is the case. Where those exceptions are happening, those are very important places for us to be working as an industry. But the vast majority of the people I interact with come with this compassionate care heart place, but actually making it happen can be very challenging. And I think what it is, is that you've got to start proactively with behavior modules that will be focused in this direction. So what does that mean? Well, you've got to start somewhere. So you got to build a relationship in your bank account, training, conditioning a bridge stimulus of some type is critical. Reward marker is the other term people use for that. That will help you communicate with your animal and expand your training tempo and also develop your relationship. Training calm, focused attention or a default behavior. So whatever the species is, like if it's a dog, most typically you're going to see sit. Even my cats, that's what I do. Sit is the calm default with my sea lions or my dolphins. I would just want a neutral stationing body position, eye contact, eyes forward. That way they're ready to receive more information. I call that the attention game. And this is the first piece of the connection that you need to have from which point you have an animal who's engaged and you can give further information to. And then for me, I would typically train a target because a target is a gateway to a a thousand options available to you. And it's such a positive way for the animal to feel confident that they know what to do and for you to explain difficult concepts like stay here or move this body part around. And it's a great redirection strategy. You can use it for differential reinforcement of incompatible behaviors. So any kind of like troubleshooting problem behaviors, eliminating, reducing problem behaviors naturally comes from having this kind of like simple, fundamental, foundational behavior. Then it would depend on the species a lot, what the other foundational behaviors might be. I immediately train right at full body exams because I think that the well-being of the physical health of the animal should be something you evaluate every day and the animal should get comfortable with that evaluation and participation. The most extreme example of this is a frog training system that I was exposed to once where they had these little poison dart frogs in a rainforest exhibit and they were about to open a quite a large exhibit. And so what they did was using associative learning, they trained a flashing light to be a presentation of a small beetle in a hill box, I think. And they flash the light and the frogs would come from all over the forest and jump down and each frog would cage itself into its pillbox because, you know, of course, you're not going to get a probably you're not going to get a a very wee frog to target its individual feet right from the beginning. But if you've got a clear container and you've got the frog in the clear container, you can do a full body exam by that mechanism. So in some cases, it might be that you train at a caging behavior. Very, very, very high on my list is caging because caging is a gateway to not having to restrain or force an animal into many of the typical things that are going to be associated with their care. Transport and anesthesia can be accomplished using a cage behavior as well as a medical exam from a veterinarian without having to restrain the animal and scare them and force them because restraint is basically random physical punishment. So everything you hate about punishment is made 10 times worse by doing it with a random contingency, meaning the animal can't control their behavior in order to eliminate the aversive. Associatively, they just learn, I am terrified of that entire scenario because there is no logic, rhyme, or reason. Or, and they try to pull out any logic, rhyme, or reason that they can, which is sort of, for example, veterinarians, people in white coats showing up is bad. That's what comes out of this, the aversive association. So cage training, I guess, in a lot of species is maybe one of the most single important things. And I'm training at that as fast as I can as well. Those are my start points. Physical exam, confidence with comfort, attention, and caging. I think those are entries. And 
if the animal doesn't do that, then I really don't want to be training for some selfish reason. I don't mean to label it like that, but you know, a show or an interaction strategy, an animal should not be capable of doing an interaction, but not able to move into a transport container. That seems weird for me. And it feels like that's the old way. And we in, as an industry need to stand up and advocate for the animal's well-being. And what that means is that we have to put a lot of time into conditioning at these foundational levels. And then from that, you can condition these other behaviors that are useful to the institution or, you know, you want to ride your horse or whatever the secondary motive. In my environment, it would be both, you know, sort of public display shows as well as research objectives. I don't go straight at the research objective. I train for the animal's well-being first. Great information. And thank you for your answer there, Jennifer. Sadly, though, we are nearly at the end, but that is okay because we're also heading into one of my favorite parts of the podcast show, and this is story time. Jennifer, can you please share with everyone listening two or three stories from your experience training animals so far and some of the important lessons you've learned along the way? Let's see. Some of my favorite stories that are brief. I had one really, really special animal who's quite famous now. In fact, she was the official mascot for the United States and all that stuff I was talking about. Her name was Saki. And she and I were together for about almost 30 years, which is a very long relationship even with humans, right? To stay and know someone that long. And when she was working with me in the open ocean, you know, research is a lot like working in in Hollywood or something. There's a lot of hurry up and wait, hurry up and wait. And so some of the times like trying to get the equipment to work and stuff like that, there'd be long, long pauses. And most animals are not that keen on boredom. Uh, Well, especially sort of active animals. There's some animals that might have had a disposition to be enthusiastic about sitting still, but Saki was not that animal. So sometimes to keep her busy and active and feeling engaged and worthwhile, we would give her behavior that she enjoyed and retrieval was one of the obvious ones she could do. So we'd throw things out and she'd bring them back. And then I came up with, oh, let's see if we can, you know, clean trash out of the ocean while we're waiting. And so we started doing an oblique retrieval cue, which just meant go find something and generalize this behavior to anything, pick something and bring it back. And eventually that evolved to one day she selected chitin shells from the floor of the ocean, which was maybe a couple hundred feet down below, although she could cover that distance in like no time at all. And they were bright white. It was a dead animal and it had these beautiful interlocking shells. And she brought it up and offered it. And typically she offered a lot of algae, you know, stuff that was readily available and kind of ho-hum and These just beautiful white shells were fantastic. I'm sure I was really overjoyed when she brought it up. And I'm certain I must have jackpotted and all sorts of other things would have been washing off of me from an interpretation standpoint from her point of view. And so ultimately, she generalized that reaction to things from the seafloor appear to be especially preferred. (laughs) And, And that led to a whole nother layer of her offering gifts, which involved a few really sad starfish and sea cucumber retrievals. (laughs) That was really unfortunate for all of us. But we often were in places that had beds of sand dollars. And so we had at one time the, the chance to capture this on video where you could actually watch the process of this selection. She would go down to the sea floor and she'd like kind of zoom over top of these beds and beds and beds of sand dollars, which are lined up like on edge with one another. So there's so many discs in a row and just thousands of them. And she somehow would select just the one, I don't know how she chose what her criterion was, but it looked like she was actually evaluating which sand dollar to choose. And then she'd bring it up to the surface. And so sand dollars became her favorite offering. And sand dollars, therefore, symbolically for me, have have a lot of meaning and warmth, I guess. They're also a bit white, you know, when they're down there. So they may have generalized from the chitin shell as well. Great story. And that does sadly now bring us to our final question for this episode. Jennifer, could you please now take us all into the future and share with us what you would like to see happen over the next 
five to 10 years in the animal training world? My top priority is to, and I think I've already mentioned this, to bring training to all aspects of all animals interacting with humans and to try to make that as volitional and positive as possible. So that instead of defaulting to force when we have to do some things, we train for that. And we train not just the easy animals or the famous animals for that, but that the frogs of the world and the cats and you know, I mean, how many people have their cats trained to give voluntary paw presents and trim their nails that way, for example, and I'm not criticizing, that's not me criticizing you. I've done that exact thing, but I now have my cat trained to sit in front of me, present its paw, and I trim the nails. And that's what I would like us to aim towards. I don't know, maybe five or 10 years, but the real care issues, I think, are for zoo animals who are trained, but they're trained through sort of typically negative reinforcement or baiting methods. And there's nothing wrong with some of that, of course. But if we did it in a deliberate and thoughtful way where we started to use cues where we trained SDs so that the animal can experience the process volitionally and can be asked to do it instead of kind of relying on the tools to form that behavior. We're going to get further and be able to use it in a lot of different ways. Because then, for example, if it's baiting, if you can get the bait out of the behavior, you can use it in a lot of other ways. And we would hope to get the negative reinforcement out of the behavior altogether. And where that's going to be really important, it seems like people bring training to the table when they have a sudden medical procedure that they have to, oh, this animal needs injections, vaccinations, we're going to have to transport the animal. So all of a sudden, like one month before this procedure happens, they start thinking, okay, can we do something behaviorally? My goal is that we're thinking that from the moment we get the animal. And that way, fewer animals are being forced and endure random physical punishment throughout the course of their lives. Institutionally, I think what that is going to mean is that somehow we can incorporate this time for training into people's work day and give the trainers the space to do this so that they have the time to do it. And if that means that they have to manage the institution's needs of a performance, then I have this concept, which I describe as take down the fourth wall. And that's referring to the theatrical wall where you pretend the audience isn't there. I'm suggesting that in your shows and in your public programs that People are allowed to, instead of dialyzed fancy show that in some ways divorces the trainer from the training, I'm saying maybe we need to step forward by taking the veil off of what we're doing, showing people how we're doing the training that we're doing, train for the animals right in front of the people and make that a part of our way of educating people about animals. I also think it's going to help the industry in general because What I suspect is happening with the anti-captivity movement is that we've got into really naturalistic, which is wonderful, naturalistic environments in zoos or shows where the person, the trainer is seemingly not doing anything. Maybe the animal is even operating without the person at all because that looks like magic. That makes a great performance. It makes for a great public performance. But what it's doing is divorcing, or I think my hypothesis is it's divorcing people from the connection that we have to animals. It's helping to connect them to the animals. And so they feel the compassion, they feel the conservation effort, but it sometimes backlashes because we're not associating ourselves with that connection that those people are making to those animals. And we need to bring our experiences of how much we care and how much work this is. We need to bring that to the forefront of what people are experiencing so that they can understand who we are as a community. And I think the side effect benefit is going to be multiple fold if we do that, because the animals will get the time and the trainers will get the time to train for the necessary care. So everyone wins. But what we have to do is kind of let go of some of the initial aspects of fancy show performances or interactions and take the fourth wall down and train for the animal's well-being. Train crate right on the exhibit. I don't give a performance where I don't show people how I care for the animals. I make that a part of every performance I ever give. And it's such an easy thing for them to grasp when you see my animals get their teeth brushed every single day. Well, the animals that have advanced to that 
point. And the public, is there something about understanding that? That connects them to the animals, but it also connects them to our care because they know as parents, they are doing that with their own kids, you know? And you can even talk to the kids in the process. Like, don't give your parents any trouble about brushing your teeth tonight because if a sea lion and a seal can brush their teeth every day, darn sure you can too, right? And it connects us all. It's in an action way, in a way that demonstrates it's not just words. It's not just a sign. You're showing your commitment to the well-being of the animals through this method. And I think you will win the hearts and minds of the public, as well as do what you want to do anyways, which is care for the animals at the highest level possible. And that means voluntary behavior all the way through their life. Train for the inevitable outcomes that are going to happen. They are going to have to visit the vet. Another idea is bring members of the audience in. I do this all the time. Bring members of the audience in as a random, I call the second person vet, and let them pretend to be the veterinarian. The animal gets used to strangers and veterinary specialists are often strangers examining them. You demonstrate the various parts of the animal's body and the whole audience can experience that through this person who is the audience member and the animal takes another step in their desensitization and you take another step in your training. Sexy, I think. I hope that's where we're going. Taking down the fourth wall. Great vision. And of course, we're all working really hard to make these things transpire as we do move forward over the coming years. As mentioned, that, however, does sadly bring us to the end. Before we wrap up from myself and on behalf of everyone listening, oceans full of Animal Training Academy gratitude to you for making the time to come on the show today, Jennifer. Thank you very, very much. You are so welcome. And remember, everybody, train with your heart and with your head. It'll get you where you want to go. And come bearing gifts. (laughs) (laughs) That's so true, too. Yeah. We do, of course, really appreciate all of you tuning in today. And I want to ask a small favor of those listening. If you do enjoy these podcasts and as a practitioner of best practice behavior management yourself, you feel that the information held within could help others, then please share this episode wherever you can on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, Pinterest, Snapchat, whatever you use, so that as a community, we can do absolutely everything within our power to disseminate this information as far and as wide as possible. And one really easy way to do this, if you are listening to it from a podcast app on your mobile device or smartphone, is there should be three little dots next to the title of next to the title of this episode. This might change slightly between devices and depending upon what app you're using. But if you click on this, there'll be an option to share the episode and then you can choose Facebook, email, however you want to share it and it's done. Really simple. Take your 30 seconds. If you could do that, that would be super. That's it for this episode. We'll wrap it up there. Thanks again so much for listening. Bye-bye, said the fly. I'm going to